Earlier in this course, you viewed a lesson entitled, A Gospel for All the Nations. In that lesson, we saw that it had always been God's will to include some people of all nations in His plan of salvation. As we saw in Peter's case, this was a difficult lesson for many of the first century Jews to comprehend. The Jews thought God had taught them to be separate from those who were not physical descendants of Abraham. But, in reality, God's command was that they should be separate from those who did not worship the one true God. For the two thousand years before the birth of Christ, God had focused His revelation of Himself upon the physical descendants of Abraham. With these people He had entered into a covenant. God gave Abraham a physical sign which was to mark every one of his male descendants with a reminder of the trust God had committed to that extended family. That physical sign was circumcision. In Genesis 17.10, God told Abraham, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Circumcision which involves the cutting away of the male foreskin, was ordained by God as a required procedure to be performed on the eighth day of a baby boy's life. By God's decree, any male who remained uncircumcised was guilty of breaking God's covenant with the people. This sanction was valid not only upon the physical descendants of Abraham, but also upon all who came to be part of any Jewish household. We read in Genesis chapter 17, verse 13 and 14, He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Not only would any uncircumcised male in or among the nation of Israel be marked as out of covenant with God, but he would be prevented from celebrating the feast of the Passover as well. We read in Exodus 12, verse 43, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. Passover was that annual ceremonial meal by which the Jewish people remembered their deliverance out of Egyptian bondage. It was originally observed by the placement of blood from the Passover lamp on the doorposts of their homes in Egypt. By this mark, the firstborn sons of the Israelites were spared the death due to all the firstborn in Egypt. The blood itself served as an indication of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. So circumcision was no small affair to the faithful Jews. It was tied to their identity as the people of God, and it served as a badge of entry of sorts for Jewish males in the worship of God and the commemoration of what he had done for his covenant people. It should not be a great surprise to us, therefore, to read in Acts 15.1 that there were certain New Testament believers who insisted that all male Gentile converts to Christianity must undergo the important procedure of circumcision. We read there, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. However, in the very next verse, we see that Paul and Barnabas, not long back from their first missionary journey together, raised a strenuous objection to this request. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas, and certain other of them, should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Paul and Barnabas objected to the teaching that all Gentile believers must be circumcised. It was decided at Antioch that messengers from both sides of the dispute should be sent to Jerusalem, where the matter would be decided by the leaders of the church assembled in that city. Jerusalem, for the time, was where many of the apostles still lived, and so it seemed a fitting location for a collective discussion of the matter. But what was the issue here? We've already demonstrated that circumcision was God's requirement for those who were in covenant with Him, 
So what was the objection by Paul and Barnabas? Had not both of these men been circumcised as eight-day-old boys? The objection does not appear to be with circumcision itself, for in Galatians Paul wrote, In Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Paul wrote that circumcision, or lack of circumcision, does not mean a thing for those in Christ Jesus. So why did he object? Well, it would appear Paul's argument was not with circumcision itself, but with the requirement of circumcision as a means of admission to the church. Notice, again from Acts chapter 15, verse 1, the mandate given by the men come to Antioch from Judea. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Paul's argument lay not in whether or not a man was circumcised, but he fought vigorously over the notion that circumcision was a requirement for salvation. The teachers from Jerusalem said that unless a man was circumcised, he could not be saved, and this was the root of the disagreement. In fact, if we turn over just a page or two in our Bibles, we read the following in Acts chapter 16. We see that Paul was in favor of performing circumcision in some cases. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Immediately after the great council in Jerusalem to decide the matter of circumcision, Paul circumcised Timothy at the start of his second missionary journey. So the objection was not with circumcision itself, just with its being deemed a requirement for salvation. And if we are going to understand the purpose of this council at Jerusalem, we must understand that this was the crux of the matter. Once the disagreement was established at Antioch, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and others should go to Jerusalem to discuss the matter with the other apostles and with the church elders who would assemble there. As they arrived in Jerusalem, the argument continued. As both sides made their arguments at Jerusalem, three men stood up to address the orthodox position, Peter, Paul, and James, and each one made a sound orthodox argument based upon a different rationale. The Apostle Peter was the first to speak, and he made his argument based upon the vision he had received from God. The Apostle Paul spoke second and justified his position on the observed work of God among the Gentiles, among whom he and Barnabas had labored. And then James, the brother of Jesus, confirmed the same position, collecting his arguments from Old Testament prophecy. Let's examine those arguments one by one. Peter was the first to make the argument here, and his words are recorded in Acts chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. Peter here made the point that it was God who ordained that the Gentiles should hear the gospel and believe. His argument begins with the fact that his listeners already know this. How did they know? They knew because back in Acts chapter 11, Peter rehearsed for them all which had happened to him in Joppa and Caesarea in the matter regarding Cornelius. Peter had already related his vision about the great sheet being let down from heaven. He had told his hearers of God's command that men were not to call unclean what God had declared to be clean. Peter then argued that God was working in the hearts of Gentiles, 
even as he worked in the hearts of us. That is, God treated these uncircumcised men in exactly the same way he treated the circumcised Jews. So why should men add something that God has not? When Peter had initially explained the events involving Cornelius, his audience reacted with exactly this attitude. We read in Acts 11:18, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So Peter's argument was that God had worked to accept the Gentiles, that the Jewish believers had already accepted this fact, glorifying God in the process, and that they should not go back now and demand some other action of obedience to prove that these Gentiles were indeed saved men. The argument made by Paul upon Peter's ending his explanation is summed up in a single verse. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Paul's argument is very similar to Peter's. Paul related how that when he and Barnabas had been preaching to the Gentiles, they were saved without any Jewish legal obligations. And, as with Peter, Paul's testimony was also received with great rejoicing, against which no claim of circumcision had been made. As Paul and Barnabas were on their way to Jerusalem from Antioch, we read, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Once again, we have a testimony that the Jews accepted the work of God in saving the Gentiles without any mention of circumcision. So why should they even hear an argument now requiring circumcision as a requirement of salvation? Then James, the third witness at the Jerusalem Council, rose to speak the words of Old Testament prophecy from the book of Amos, chapter 9. James' words, as reported in Acts 15, are as follows. After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. James not only acknowledged that it was always God's plan to save the Gentiles, but that indeed it was God who was doing the work, just as he said he would. The argument of each of these godly men is that God had already accomplished the work of saving these various Gentiles. There was no place for men to add requirements to the finished work of God. Peter summed up the argument well when he said in Acts 15.11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. All men that are saved are saved only because the grace of God applies the finished work of Jesus Christ to their hearts, and so saved Jews and saved Gentiles have been saved by the exact same means throughout all time. The council which met at Jerusalem in around the year 50 is important to the history of the Christian church for another reason, though. Not only was the council's work a confirmation that the gospel for all nations is a gospel of God's unmerited favor alone, what we call grace, but it is also important for the precedent it set for future generations. As we continue beyond the first century in our study of the Christian history of Western civilization, we will be studying a number of councils that met in various cities over the years. These faithful men attending these councils worked hard to understand and commit to writing what the Orthodox Church believes about the Gospel. In the lesson, Back When the Church Was Pure, we looked at the concept taught in 1 Corinthians 11.19, where Paul wrote, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. You will remember the word heresy speaks of deciding something for yourself, which is to say, theologically, contrary to the accepted truth revealed by God. As human history unfolded, God's truth did not change. However, 
It was God's hand of almighty providence which allowed heresies among men to arise so that the faithful would come together and discuss what, as Luke describes in the opening of his gospel, were those things which are most surely believed among us.